All right, man, do I have some shit to talk about today. Let me turn this bitch on so y'all can see my motherfucking face. Now that you know me, I'm the demons in me. When you give it to me, come on, come on, get down with the sickness. Sorry, I was tra- rocking out. Um, so this episode goes out to my dog. Literally, not like my dog, yo, bro, 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 dog, 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 like it's some wankster. I don't know, my actual dog. My dog, Mia, has passed away. Um, she was pretty old, 13 years old, 12 years old. So, I don't know, would have been 13 this year, but like this November, so. But still, that's pretty fucking old for a dog. Fortunately, today, I was going to take the day off, or get off early, and bring her to the vet and have her put down. Because she's been slowly going and going, and then it was yesterday that she got taking taking a turn for the worse. And I've seen this before, um, and it's just to the point where she couldn't do anything anymore, pick it up. So you know, I go out and see her. I kept her comfortable in the garage. I lay down with her. I pet her. I feed her. I don't want to cry again, so I'm gonna try not to fucking cry again. But um. Yeah, my dog passed away, so that was pretty shitty. Um, Saturday night when I released the video about my ex-friend Justin, I was going to actually... I was getting ready to do a mercy kill on my dog that night. Um, until all that shit happened. Because I wanted her to go out where she could at least run around one more time. Have fun one more time, you know, just me and her by the water or something like that. And this way, you know, our last number would be something like that. But then all that bullshit happened, and like straight up. So as I'm uploading that video with all that shit about me and that guy Justin, my ex friend Josie and all that bullshit, she fucking calls me. Josie calls me. Why the fuck did you tell Justin we had sex? Uh, first of all, I got two text messages from her stating, why did you tell Justin that we had sex? If you don't want to answer me, I'm coming down to your house to straighten this out with your wife. So I didn't see that because I was uploading my video and recording the video. I, I, I have it on do not disturb mode. No one disturbs me when I do my shit. Fuck all that shit. I come out of that while it's uploading, I look and I see all this shit. So I call her. So she's pulling a heavy on me on the phone right off the hop, like, why the fuck did you tell Justin? Blah, 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 blah. And like, she's asking me a question but not letting me talk. So I just fucking scream like, Josie! Like, fucking let me talk or shut, like, no, let me talk and shut the fuck up, basically. And then she starts crying. <laughs> I have that effect, I guess. But, and then she hangs up on me. So I was like, what the fuck? Like, I was under the assumption that she had something to do with this. Then after reading the text, my assumption and what I've come to and I'm pretty sure it's accurate after Justin tried to accuse me of getting me to admit or come over so he can catch this hypothetical fantasy in his head when that didn't work out he straight up asked Josie um, and was told Josie that I admitted to it to get her to admit to it obviously there's nothing to admit to so she's like what the fuck why would Corey fucking say that just to get me in shit because you know Justin obviously played it like no no stop lying to me I know you two are fucking she no I never fucked I don't know why you would say that I haven't seen Corey since fucking August blah 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 probably all that noise and he just keeps going trying to get her to admit to a fucking fantasy because between the drugs and his fucking conspiracy bullshit he's stuck in his little fucked up fantasy so that's what happened so I'm losing my mind I take the alcohol I have in the house for the spirits and I fucking chug it back and I'm threatening them. I tell them to come to my house. I'm putting my axe in your fucking face, bud. You're done. I'll drive to your fucking house and I tell her straight up the name of the girl he fucked that night and just just losing my mind. I'm posted up outside waiting. Forgot all about what I'm supposed to do with my dog. It's really pissed me off. Fucking their bullshit make me stop my plans and the shit I have to do with my fucking dog. Take care of my business because some fucking drug addict piece of fucking garbage blames me for some fucked up shit. And then the next day I wake up and my dog can't do fuck all. You know? Thanks a lot you fucking piece of shit. That's all I got to say to your fucking ass. But anyways, seriously, I ever see you dog, you're fucking done. 
straight up. Don't ever fucking come near me. Don't come near my house. You know, it was one thing to fucking blame me to fucking bang in your old fucking lady because you're fucked up on dope. But because of all this shit, I had to fucking... I had to kill my dog myself, which I was planning on doing anyways, but it was going to be a nice way. It was going to be a, a, you know, a mercy kill and her having fun. But she didn't even get to do that. So, God only knows what happened over fucking night when I wasn't with her, when I couldn't see her, but then when I woke up the next day, I went downstairs and I see how she was, I was like, fuck! It's like, anyways, I'm fucking pissed. Pissed, you know, about this fucking idiot wasting my fucking Saturday night fucking with him and his dumb fucking, oh my god. Anyways, so, nonetheless, so, I go in the garage, I get her all comfortable for the day, and then when I realized there was no coming back from it, there was nothing I could do to get her to try to, and she's just looking at me like, I gotta go, let me go, you know, and so, I did it with my bare hands, took her life, killed her, and it's not like I just killed her, just to kill her, like I killed her because she was suffering, I could see it, she couldn't do nothing, she couldn't move, she didn't want to eat, when a dog, dogs love eating, man, and like, I don't give her much food, the odd time, I sprinkle a little, we do food with her food, you know what I mean, the first meal of the day, not the second, if I give her two, but, you know, um, and like, so when I started seeing this start happening, and she's getting up there and she's like, well, whatever. She doesn't have much to live for. We weren't going for walks anymore because of her paw. And, you know, so... So I started giving her, like, just human food. No fucking dog food. Let her enjoy herself. And then yesterday she couldn't even eat it. You know? Well, the first one was a bunch of chicken bones and with a bunch of chicken left on it. And she, like, managed to eat that. So I'm okay. And that's when I went up. I was like, okay, well, maybe she can... Maybe it's just who knows what. So I give her some medicine to get her to cope. So I hopefully I can get through the day, play with her, have fun with her, you know, do my plan. And none of that was possible, obviously. So then I had to take her life, which is fucked. And people might say, what the fuck? You took your own dog's life while well, paying a fucking vet to do it. First of all, it's just going to cost me like $300 or more. And then they're going to want to dispose of the body. It's like, no, I want my pet on my property with me. Either that or I can't burn her. So if I could, I probably would. If it was summertime or somewhere, I'd probably try to get away with it. Because that's probably the, you know, the best way. And then after that would be some water. But I don't want to put a corpse in a fucking body of water for a way. Though I thought about it. So the best bet is to let her go on the ground. And I know the earth, man. The earth will just deteriorate her. She'll get neutralized. The energy will be absorbed. And, you know, because anything I've ever... I mean, this is far cry for an organic, you know, um, dog tissue. Um, canine tissue. But, you know, plastic, glass, um, anything you put in the earth gets gone. You know what I mean? The earth, she just fucking... She just mows over everything. Kills everything. So, and this is why, like, if you're doing spells, and you do your spells manifest, well, whichever means you do your spell by, whether it's candle magic, essential, or whatever, you got to get rid of it. Thing you used to the physical representation, the brand of the physical, but for you to be able to put energy into, you know, this physical representation of what you want to manifest. You put energy into it, it tells great on the actual, and then you get rid of it off this plane. Now it's on the astral, but not here, so it has to filter down, and the other way, which is your manifestation coming reality. That's how this shit works. That's one of the simplest ways I can explain how things get manifested. How manifesting what you want actually happens. Straight up. You have a sigil of, I want $3,000, or I am grateful I received $3,000. Well, that sigil, if you hold on to that sigil, put energy into it, you can create on the astral, as long as you have that situation, well, there's a good chance it's not going to manifest, you know what I mean? But, as soon as you burn that, then you no longer have a physical representation here on this plane, therefore, once you, once you burn it, put it in the ground, whatever the case is, then, by uh, nature, of course, that vacuum, to fill that, that gap, fill that need, fill that space, you created that. That's us manipulating 
this law of nature. It's as simple as I can put it. So if you want to do magic, successful magic, well, these are some, this is some of the rules you have to go by. You have to will something into reality by creating a symbolic representation that you can get that symbolic representation through your subconscious mind, which is your link to the astral plane via the moon, the subconscious mind, right? And once you put enough energy into that subconscious mind, or whatever is that symbolic, because she, the subconscious mind, understands symbolism, understands the word as much unless you train it to. So, but once you do that, you get rid of that fucking thing you have, then she manifests the thing that's on the actual and it's no longer physical around. So, how I got on here. Anyway, so yeah, I don't even know how I got on that. So. Anyway, oh yeah, I'm just talking about how the dirt would, is going to eat up my dog, basically, and you know turn her into whatever she needs to turn into. But once again, another message from my ex friend, and I know a lot of people don't like this because I just got 64 subscribers, back down to 62. You know, What's the alternative? I don't threaten this guy, he comes to my fucking house, and he's gonna be a fucking cheat, fucking his fucking wife. If I don't fucking stand up for myself and just let it go and send you love, what's he gonna do? He's gonna keep doing dope, blaming me for something I never fucking did, which has already fucked up my plan for me and my dog. You know, my dog's never gonna be back again. I can never get that last night of fun that I had planned for her. I wanted to have this nice night. I'm never gonna get that back. Is that all his fault? No. I could have not entertained it. I said, you know what? Put all this bullshit on hold and I'll fucking deal with that after I do my fun day with my dog. I could have did that. Problem was, she or he, I couldn't tell at the time, who was threatening to come to my fucking house. So I wasn't going to leave my house with my wife and fucking kids there with some fucking crystal meth, purple fucking pebbles, fucking Xanax fucked up, fucking six foot fucking skinny little fucking faggot come to my fucking house while I'm not there, you know what I mean? I'm going to kill my dog, which would have been fucked after I do that, come back, then I would have probably fucking killed him if he was there, you know, God forbid. And so we're just a bad situation all around. So the last thing I needed to do was, you know, plus it, I would have been tainted either way. After all that, if I would have went in the night anyways with my dog, I would have been coming to had a good time. I've been thinking, either way, he kind of ruined it. And I'm not one to blame other people, but it's like, man, like, who the fuck are you to just blame me when you got no proof of fucking nothing? And I don't know why you think your wife was fucking me. I don't know if it's because she watches my stuff. Probably not. I don't know why you would think that. I have no fucking idea why that would come up. Not once did I ever fucking flirt with her in front of you. Not once did I ever even check her out in front of you. I made damn sure that anytime she was wearing anything, like short shorts or anything like that, that I wouldn't disrespect my friend by not looking at his wife in front of me. Which is weird, whatever. So, you know, the times that happened whenever I was over there and she didn't know I was maybe there. And she just got out of the window. There was never anything really inappropriate. But the point is, I never even gave a reason for that shit. So it's like, for him to just fucking do all that, but nonetheless, this episode goes out to Mia, my dog, I miss you, I love you, I made a bunch of candles for you at uh, the time you're passing, I know you can't really hear me, but it just makes me feel better to say this, um, and you know, like, I don't know what happens after a dog dies, I don't know what happens after we die, well, let's say the dog has to advance to a human soul, well, I made a fucking candle saying that, you know, if that's how this fucking shit works, then my dog should totally get a chance to fucking advance to so because she was the greatest dog anybody could have had. She was loyal, she was obedient, you know, and obviously she had her flaws, everybody fucking does it, but big was, you know what, like she listened to me, she loved me, she was great now to me, great to me, you know what I mean? And I mean, I wasn't always a perfect woman, you know, I could have spent more time with her, I could have turned her a lot of shit I would do, obviously. And, you know, you can say-
say it's just a dog, it's just a dog. It's like, no, it's not just a dog, you know? It's part of my family. Like, it's more than a fucking decade I had this thing. You know, so. But, as to say, Justin, you fucking come around, bud. I got all this anger I already have pent up towards you. Plus, you fucking up my last night with my fucking dog. Okay? I got all this animosity, bud. And my 60 fucking pound sledgehammer's gonna fucking bring you on the side of your fucking head. And you're gonna be putting the fucking dirt beside her. If I have to. Because if I kill you, I might as well try to hide you. Because I'm gonna be fucked to go to jail anyways. But anyways, the point was... The alternative of me... I don't threaten this motherfucker. I don't fucking show him that I fucking mean business. If I just let him run his fucking game and ignore him, will he go away? Potentially. Potentially. But prior to that, he needs to know that the only thing he's got is the ability to be a bitch and run his mouth. Because if I don't threaten him, then he thinks he's tough. And then he thinks he's got me. And then he's going to And then I really have to fucking knock his ass out. Which I don't need a fucking charge. I don't need something. I don't need none of that shit. I've gone to trouble. I fucking went to jail. You know what I mean? Like, I don't need that. And I mean, you know, a dog's a far cry from a human, but I'm the type of person that has the capacity to be able to kill an animal with his bare hands. Choke her out. The animal sledgehammer was just a case I wasn't able to do that for whatever reason. And it's a lot easier, but I just, you know. But nonetheless, can I do that to this motherfucker? fucking right if I was mad enough, you know, there's, there's utility in knowing, knowing that you can hurt something, and finding ways to not do that, so, you know, I'll say my piece, and if he ever wants to try me, well, fuck, I'm going to fight a long time, it might actually be therapeutic, ha <laughs> ha, alright, I stopped talking like that, but I said I'd be talking about magical stuff, so I'm try talking about magical stuff, Just a shitty, <laughs> just a shitty situation all around. You know? It's also a shitty situation. There's not much you can do about it. Animals are gonna die. We're all gonna die. It's something you've gotta get used to. I mean, after I did it, I broke down. Right? At first, I was okay. Okay, not really. Like I was just walking around my outside, smoke after smoke after smoke, not knowing what the fuck I should do. I guess I knew intuitively, like I didn't even do this on purpose, but I mean, now that I think about it, obviously there's a part of me that was in control doing this, so I put on all these fucking sad songs, like where I carry um, a voice to bed. I know you're looking down on me from heaven. It's like an 80s song, or a 90s song. So, yeah, yeah, I can't remember, I had something like that, I put on that song. I just made the fucking tears pop, you know. It's, I'm glad because, you know, I got a lot of it out. She was still some more in me. I'm sure there's still some more in me that's going to come out at some point. But, I guess I was trying to, I mean, like I said, I didn't even know I was doing this, but I guess I was trying to force this shit out of me so I could deal with it all at once. So I'm going to have to deal with it later. Because, like, if you don't mourn, it's like anything. Any emotional loss, any trauma, any bad happens, if you don't fucking let it out, I mean, it's just gonna, it's gonna stay in the build up or something. I'm locking myself in there. Made two fucking candles. To help her, whenever she um, moves on to the other rounds. It's fucking good. You're a fucking fuck. Anyway. Oh, yeah. Basically put all these sad songs on and force the fucking tears out, force the emotions out, force me to fucking feel what I need to feel, get over what I need to get over. Last night wasn't a great sleep because you know I still see the thought and I still see the picture of when I did it to her. Which is terrible. And I know I probably shouldn't be saying this, but I gotta get off my chest. 
Try to get it off my chest. I miss my dog. And you think I'm a bad person because I killed my own pet? Well, I don't know. I was responsible for her. She was my fucking pet. You know, and I had this whole day planned out before I would do this, and I didn't get to do that. And she's sitting there suffering, and I can't get her in front of a vet until Monday. So what am I supposed to do? Let her fucking suffer? Let her just sit there fucking not being able to eat, drink, nothing, feeling pain, you know? I mean, I know she's an animal, and she's not necessarily happy to with cortex. <laughs> no way does she have consciousness. She's just all subconscious, right? All instinctual. Instinctual, whatever. But still, I mean, while she's in that body, she's feeling something. She's got a nervous system. As long as that nervous system detaches that brain, she's feeling that pain. So, you know, detach that for her so she would feel that pain again. That makes me a bad person. Well, it's like, well, I'd rather not let my pup suffer. You know, I'd rather let her go on to be go wherever she needs to go. Whether that's puppy heaven, whether that's just the next realm after this, whether that's whatever the fuck it is, it doesn't matter. That's where she is now. And I put her there, and, you know, maybe uh, now she'll not murder her to play here, maybe I shouldn't have murdered her, I don't fucking know, but I didn't murder her in cold blood, I murdered her in fucking out of mercy, I just don't let, not wanting her to suffer anymore, you know, so, <laughs> so, anyways, it is as it is, as they say, but I'll try not to do any more episodes about but I thought it was a good example among many things. I thought it was a great example of conspiracy and what drugs will do to you. Um, both, both alone will probably bring you to that certain place. But conspiracy by itself probably won't run your life into the ground. But it's not going to do much good for you either, right? I mean, at all. Really. Nothing good going to come from fucking watching the conspiracy bullshit. But, oh, man, Jesus fucking Christ, I hate when I get these going. It's, it's, it's just my room. I don't know what I would do it. But, um, but yeah, I thought it was a good example of what conspiracy bullshit will do to you. I know. You know? His problem is a combination of both. Taking in conspiracy crap, alien crap, world doom and gloom fucking company crap, and doing the drugs to back home. One of those things will work life. Find something. Both of them will spiral you down fast. And it's not something I want for anybody, even though I don't like this fucking guy at all. I don't wish that on him. I don't want him to be in that. I want him to spark the fuck up and take care of his fucking daughter. He's got a little fucking beautiful little girl that needs a fucking dad, not a fucking immature little fucking bitch of a fucking dad. And you know, I think, for the most part, I think, you know, both of them are pretty good parents when they're not by. I don't want to judge anyway. Actually, the people I used to be very much like, I used to be very much like, I'm going to judge them. I've had the same issues. The only reason why I'm luckier than them. Besides my chart and my placement of Jupiter, which anybody over Jupiter and Pisces like I have, say, uh, Pisces in the 12th house, Jupiter provides the kind of protection over not being completely consumed and taken over by drugs. Addictive personality. I'm going to enjoy drugs. I like drugs. It's only a battle. It's not going to consume me. I'm not going to be one of those people on the street. I'm still going to want and be able to maintain nice things. But, you know, it would be a lot easier if I didn't have this drug issue. But the problem is, Jupiter and Pisces, everything gets expanded. So I can be around somebody who wants to do drugs and like take on that feeling, is how it was explained to me. So when you have Jupiter and Pisces, Pisces takes on most, most empathetic, empathic, most 
sensitive sign in between the worlds. Only two fish tied together in between the worlds. So you take on people's energies. So, but whereas that's that's a curse because if I go down, for example, who knows why I started using drugs? But once I did, and I had to get off it. Like, I'll quit drug addicts every fucking day when I was at that clinic. So, I'm with these people. Obviously, there's people in there that want to get high. They're there to get high because we get high off that one. And then I leave there. Oh, you get high. And then maybe I do. Maybe I do pick up, let's just say, hypothetically. But then, around my family, like my kids, like my wife, around, you know, whoever else doesn't want to get high or wants to do other shit. Eventually, I pick up that energy. So it's, you know, whether you want to look at it as Jupiter is a god, Jupiter is a shield, but Jupiter protects me, or it's just that I don't ever stay around that people long enough to get consumed by it. Who knows why? But but not only for that reason that I'm lucky, it's my wife was not an addict. Drugs, or ever wanted to do drugs, or anything like that. Fucking hard, man. Um, so that's where I was lucky. I never wanted to lose my wife, so I never wanted her to find out when I was fucking up with drugs. But in the same sense, you know, them two both did drugs. So imagine thinking your partner's holding out on you, or the partner doesn't want to give you something. Whatever, you know, you want it, or whatever the case may be, there's two of you with a problem versus just one. Because that was my problem. I'm my wife. So, that's the reason why I was like, I've never done drugs. I only drink some So, anyways, I don't know if you can say much more about that. I'm going to come back and have something to talk about. That's just something I want to say. This is Tamiya, this is Mia, love you, Justin, fuck yourself, <laughs> seriously, I'm gonna, I'm gonna hold you like, something like, it's not your fault that Mia died, it's your fault that I didn't get to do stuff, or she died, that I wanted to, so, so regardless, it's gonna kill her, kill that energy, kill the next day, it was a mercy kill, but I wanted to have fun with her one more time, I wanted her to have a nice happy like, I believe in that if you die in fear, you get absorbed by the fear consciousness, the uh, fear energy, and if you die in love, you get absorbed by the love consciousness. I mean, I can't prove it, I don't know if it's real or fake, but what I do know is it seems way more likely than anything else anybody's trying to fucking propagate and tell us about, so I didn't want her to die in fear. That was the whole point. The whole point was so I don't get to die in fear. So I don't ever get to talk one more talk, one more walk. Playtime, one more, you know, just me and her having a good time together, and then, and then I would do it too, and hope for the best. But I don't know what happened, and when it all went wrong, and if she was scared or not, and if that even applies to dogs or not. But in case it does, because it's something I think is accurate, I didn't want my dog to get absorbed by a fear consciousness, which, which is another reason why I did those candles. So I know that would happen. I'm so grateful she got absorbed by the love consciousness. Incarnated to whatever the next step is for her. All right, so all that to be said, and now I'm going to get into projection, ideal, killing your ideal. Um, I'm going to use my ex friend just as an example. I'm not going to talk to him about him or or go into details about him but just say how by turning me into the enemy what he was doing how I am like Abel and he is like Cain to use a bible story and Cain wants to slew Abel because I'm liked I'm successful and I'm everything he's not that he wants to be and I'm going to relate this to how the world is right now how everybody in the world Except for the elites, the 1% who are doing well, and people like me who are aspiring to be that 1%. 
everybody else potentially maybe not the people that don't know about this maybe the people that are working that are still not awake yet they're, but they're probably better off those stuck in truth and conspiracy probably worse off than those who have no idea about any spirituality or truth or whatever the case is so I'm going to make the case that from my friend to the rest of the world that's what's happening right now is most people are in fear they are hating and demonizing that that which they don't know. And because they don't understand it and can't use it to their benefit, they rather make excuses. So I'm going to give you some clear pictures of that. First, I'm going to play Peterson, who is going to say this in a few different ways. Um, and then I'm going to come back on and tell you how he was doing that like that. And how those people of the world are doing that to the point of everybody thinks they're a victim right now. You know, walking around capital with guns like a militia. And because they're not having their freedom of speech or they're having their freedoms um, trampled or they don't have their freedoms or they, you know, they feel like they've been hurt. Yeah, they're pretty fucking free. And that's a quote from like, uh, not a quote, but that's an idea from Thunder Wizard's new video, which is great, by the way. So, yeah. Same mother. I mean, mothers are very complex, and mother for child A and mother for child B are not the same mother, even if they happen to be the same human being. The literature is quite clear on that. But you get my point. But God's idea was not only are you not doing well because you're not doing well, but you're not doing well because you've actually really spent a lot of work figuring out how to not do well. This is like creative effort on your part. And if you read about truly malevolent people and you could start with the Columbine killers because they left some very interesting diaries behind so I would recommend them if you there's plenty of serial killers you could read about and the people who've really gone out and done dark things and I've read more than my fair share of that sort of thing and understand it quite well um, if you really want to have your countenance fall and be wroth ten years of brooding on your own catastrophe sort of alone and letting your fantasies take shape and, and, and egging them on and, and allowing them to flourish and, let's say, take possession of you because that's exactly the right way to think about it. All right. Did you hear that? So, 10 years of brooding on a catastrophe. So, let's say I was fired from Matrix about five years ago, six years ago. He wasn't long after me. He's been at home. Maybe, um... Maybe on some sense that's one of the reasons. Maybe he blames me. Maybe he couldn't work there anymore because I wasn't there. He used to have a job after I got fired. So who knows? But he could have kept working there. So maybe he blames me for that. He's like, this is my fault. So he's brooding on the fact that he doesn't have this good paying job anymore. Because of me. Him and his wife are fighting. You know, maybe he blames me for a whole bunch of other things. And then on top of that, I got ten grand when I left there. Because I did magic. He didn't. No one else after me who got fired got 10 grand, so who the fuck knows, but, um, so that pisses them off. Now I'm doing well. i still maintaining my house, haven't lost it, maintaining my car, got a, I mean, upgraded my car, 2018 Nissan Pathfinder, bigger, more room, four-wheel drive, whatever, you know, leather, uh, moonroof, sunroof, you know, so I got my house, got my kids, everything's working great, you know, so he's brooding on this. And letting, as you hear what Peterson said, start letting your fantasies take hold of you, you know? Putting on your catastrophe. That, that sounds exactly like what Justin was doing. It's exactly what he's doing. So, in some way, shape, or form, I'm his ideal. I'm what he wants out of life. He doesn't want to be doing drugs. But if he is, he wanted to be having some kind of happy balance. Because, you know, which is not a cop-out or am I promoting having balance doing drugs? I'm not promoting that at all. But I had a healthier balance than he did. He had to do it every day. Or wanted to do it every day. Whereas I could stop. I could not do it days. You know, there I had times where I couldn't, for sure. But for the most part, towards the end, I went in but before I stopped, I was able to only do it a few days a week and then not do it other days of the week and just be just fine. So I was that balance, that ideal, that like, holy fuck, he's a drug addict, just like me, same work, same job, same clinic. I can have what he has. But instead, he watches all this conspiracy stuff. 
telling him why the world sucks, why he's not doing well, why everything is wrong, you know. And then he comes to me and tells me that when we're still talking. And I say, man, that's not true. But you can believe what you want to believe. But as far as I'm concerned, that's not accurate. Because look, I was still doing drugs at that time. But I was starting to still manifest stuff. This is like a few years ago. But I was still manifesting things, you know. I was still having good luck. I was still being able to pay my bills. And it's like, so if you don't watch that stuff, it won't affect your mind. And you'll be able to do great and wonderful things. And he didn't want to believe that. And that's the beginning. Because then he used to send me these man messages. Like when we were still talking. Like, bro, the world's got to be flat. What about this? What about this? What about this? And I would just say, no, man. Like, it's not true. There's this reason. There's this, there's this, there's this. And, man, I don't know if this is real or not. But from what I know, these are all the reasons why that's probably not a possible hypothesis, you know. And then you'd be upset. And I wouldn't hear from him for a while. And sometimes i go to his house and he wouldn't answer the door. I would try to assume he was just paranoid and didn't have anything. So I'd just not get mad. But who knows why, you know. So, yeah. Just listen to that and see if there's anybody in your life that you can imagine who's doing this to you. Or if you've ever done this and see if there's something maybe you should change and there's something in your life or a group of people that you treat like this or are blaming. And if so, try to switch that as fast as possible before you can let your before you let your fantasies take hold. That'll get you somewhere like this. And there are more people who are like that than you think. And you're more like that than you think. Well, so Cain, he's obviously not very happy about this whole answer, obviously, because the last thing you want to hear if your life is turned into a catastrophe and you take God to task for creating a universe where that sort of thing was allowed is that it's your own damn fault and you should straighten up and fly right, so to speak, and you shouldn't be complaining about the nature of being but that is the answer he gets. And so then what happens? Well, we have to infer that if Cain was angry before, that he's a lot more angry now. And, of course, that's exactly what the story reveals. And Cain talked with Abel, his brother. And it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and slew him. I'm going to read you something else now. This is foreshadowing again. This is from the same chapter, by the way. Do what is meaningful, not what is expedient. Jesus was led into the wilderness, according to the story, to be tempted by the devil, Matthew 4, 1, prior to his crucifixion. This is the story of Cain, restated abstractly. Cain is far from happy, as we have seen. He's working hard, or so he thinks, but God is not pleased. Meanwhile, Abel is dancing away in the daisies. His crops flourish, women love him. Worst of all... He's a pretty good guy. Everyone knows it. He deserves his good fortune. All the more reason to hate him. I used to joke when I, I used to teach at Harvard, and now there are other great things going for them. They had to add, like, respectability and likability to it as well. So you thought, well, you know, it really couldn't happen to a better person. It's like, good God. Well, that's, that's, that's Abel's situation, you know. It's like, and, you know, the funny thing, too, is that that's an ideal. That's the ideal, right? Because an ideal person, let's say, would be someone who you would want to be like and, and someone who is operating in the world like you would want to operate and someone whom fortune was smiling on and someone who was making the right sacrifices. It's really what you would want to be. And so Cain kills that. Right, so it's a psychological story too. And you see this in the cynicism that people have about people who have done well in the world. They're always looking for some reason why they've done well. They must be crooked or they must be, they must be conniving or they must be arrogant or they must be psychopathic. Or, and, oh, and of course, all of them. All right, since he doesn't say it, they must be aliens. They must be lizards. They must be Illuminati. They must be satanic. They must be part of the Bohemian Grove. They must be the elites. They must be the deep state. They must be the extreme left or the extreme right. They must be um, Illuminati. I don't know if I already said that. They must be, uh, who knows? Just a few more to add to that list instead of trying to fucking fix your life. 
You're going to blame these groups because they fucked up the world. And that's why you're on fucking welfare or why you have a shitty job and you can't go to school and make your life better. It's not because of you. It has nothing to do with you. You can't do anything better with your life. No. No, no. It's these groups that don't even know you exist. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Yes, but it's a very bad trick to play on yourself to make the proposition that the person in the world who re represents your own ideal is that ideal because of despicable reasons. Because what you do is train yourself that the ideal that you should pursue can only exist if it's motivated by despicable reasons. And then what? Not only is Abel your brother dead as your brother in the field in reality, but you've also slaughtered your own ideal. See, for me, Justin Chartrain represents a part of my past that I don't ever want to have. And by me saying I, I don't want nothing to do with him, I would kill him if he came here, I don't know if that's necessarily a good thing or not, okay? But it's like trying to tell that part of me that, you know, may want to relapse new drugs that I'm no longer going to relapse. This person who used to, who I used to actively go, I'm not saying it was his fault by any stretch of imagination, I went to see him by my own free will. So it was my fault. But I, I, I'm closing that door of my life now. You know, I'm slamming that shut, never to be opened again. Just never try to anyways, right? So, in my sense, it's, it's almost a positive thing. Whereas in his sense, he is still in that place where conspiracy and doing drugs and blaming people is his life. And something that he could achieve. Because he's not, you know, I said he was kind of gullible. He would take people's ideas. But he's an intelligent person. Or at least he was at one point. Like, maybe not necessarily street smart. And I don't mean that in an arrogant way. Like, he can handle himself on the street. But, I mean, like, he'd be more likely to be taken advantage of or believe someone at first glance. You know what I mean? So that kind of thing. But intelligent-wise or work ethic-wise, like, he was good. Just as, if not, potentially could have even been better than me. You know? So, I don't think there's anything bad about that. Problem is, he's killing me the drug addict person who has a hard life who becomes a success gets a house gets a car gets a you know and all these things are just material things but still he wants those things he can say it's pointless to have those things all he wants deep down inside most people want at least one or two of these items you know maybe they don't necessarily need a house because they're fine paying rent or maybe they necessarily don't need a car because they're in a city where they're having a car is just useless. You know, there are those circumstances. But for the most part, in my town, it's not hard to have those things. And, you know, anybody who holds down a regular job at any rate can basically own a car. It's not that difficult. But, once again, there's some people that don't want it. There's some people with the pollution thing. So I'm not, just saying, I'm not trying to say having a car in a house is like the thing to do. Like, don't take that from what I'm trying to say. But married okay with a bunch of children a successful father i'm always trying to up my game i've proven my manifestation comes in you know point is he is turning me into the enemy on the satanic devil worshiping magic is either isn't real or it's of the devil plus now i'm also fucking his wife so if i wasn't evil and deceiving enough right like like, let's say, well, maybe the magic shit I am preaching is good. Well, I still can't do it because Corey's fuck up my wife. So that makes him a bad person. So even if his stuff is real, never going to do it. You know what I mean? It's giving himself a new excuse to not do the practices, the exercises he should do to fix his life. And we all know what happens if you hate money. If you have this internal block, if you have this programming that money is the root of all evil, then your subconscious won't allow you to have money. Your reality maker part of you won't allow you to get money because, or in excess of money, you'll, you'll be allowed to have whatever you were programmed that you saw your parents have, whatever your, your set point is in your head, which is easily moved up. And once you move your set point up, money starts flowing to you. I moved it, and guess what? We broke three figures this year. So... I was curious on how to increase my set point because I heard Freddie Xavier talk about you have um, a financial set point, meaning you have a financial set point 
in your head that says you can make up to this much a year. It was programmed from your parents, um, plus you, plus what you've been making, plus the people around you. You know, all these things program you for what you should make. So I've made a bunch of symbolic ge- gestures, symbolic representations, candles straight up saying I fucking, my new set point is three figures, you know. And now it is. But I also brought a Freighter Xavier program that, I also bought a Freighter Xavier program that I, that tells you how to do that. Oh, and guess what? I forgot all about this. Every Freighter Xavier program I bought, I shared with my friend. I shared with Justin. I sent them to him. Free of charge. Yeah. And to me, that's a big deal. You know, here's some free programs. If you don't want to take my word for how magic works, take this guy's word. Here's his free page. You can learn a lot just from his free YouTube page. And every program I ever bought, I gave him. Except for one because it just wasn't it wasn't saved onto my Gumroad anymore. So for him to be able to use it, he had to sign into my Gumroad and use my account. Which, according to Freder Xavier's rules for his egregore platform, you're allowed to do that. Now, if Justin wants to take copies of that and show other people, then the thought form would come after him. But I wasn't doing that. I almost did that a few times by accident because I recorded them so I can have them even if I don't have data or whatever the case is before I had them saved to my phone for whatever silly reason just because I need space on my phone for my videos. But I decided to record them and it's like, well, if I can just save it on my phone, I might as well just do that. But anyway, so I recorded them and I almost played them once on a video by accident. So, But point is, in one way, shape, or form, I'm an ideal. And this goes for everybody out there who's blaming Illuminati or lizards or whatever the case is. Any successful 1% are out there. If they want to become rich, if they want to be wealthy, if they want to be successful. And they're sitting there blaming these groups, saying they're evil, they're aliens, they're satanic, whatever they are. Okay, whatever they're saying these groups are. And if they want to achieve some kind of success, they have just demonized their ideal therefore once that's deep embedded inside of them their subconscious subconscious or unconscious or whatever that creative that part of you that creates reality that create is a reality maker that part of you will not allow you to be that because you have deemed it evil and it does not want to make you evil because you're the good guy even hitler thought he was the good guy as peter said and says something beautiful in here about hitler saying Hitler had the organizational genius to act on that part of him that we all have. He's like, people don't do the things that Hitler did because of some moral sense of whatever. They do it because they they don't do what Hitler did because they don't have the organizational genius, meaning how he was able to blame a group and get in everybody's head and be able to actually organize a country to do this. He had that ability within him. So even though he was fucked, he had some type of organizational genius in him. And I'm not for Hitler at all. But I've always said that from reading his book, I I could deem that he was a hurt, sad, intelligent man. You know, so. But this is him playing out. This is all these people doing this capital thing are actually embracing that Hitler inside of them. They're letting out that anger part of them, that I'm oppressed part of them, that fucking whatever. But they don't have all the facts. They don't know how many people died for their freedom, for their ability to go to the Capitol with guns, to be able to sign that permit, to have that gun walk around the Capitol and from in front of media, um, for the free press, the media, everywhere for to see whether it's independent, YouTube people or whoever, for everybody to sit there and record this person speaking, saying he's oppressed while he sits there with a gun and says he's going to start shooting it if he's upset. You know, it's like, are you kidding me? When Thunder Wizard played that, I was like, oh my God, it was such a great video because of that. And then the one girl who was a real estate agent who was getting arrested, thinks she shouldn't get arrested because she was following her president's orders. It's like, well, people follow other people's orders all the time and get arrested. Go walk in a jail cell, honey. You'll see a bunch of guys saying, this isn't fair. I shouldn't be here. But you broke the law. Your president didn't follow you in there. He stayed where he was and everybody else went in. But you broke the laws and guess what? If they don't arrest people for breaking those laws, then people are going to keep breaking those laws. If they don't want this shit to ever happen again, they're going to have to come down hard on the people that did this shit. 
She might want to think about that before you blindly take on someone else's ideology, someone else's programming, someone else's beliefs. Just take it on yourself and go in there and sacrifice your life for them. When they really don't have your back, because Trump does not have anybody's back anymore. And I don't have an opinion on this, and I've always said that. And I know Thunder Wizard says people say that, and they're just scared. But it's like, I'm Canadian, man. I don't know the right and the left of the states that well enough to speak on it. But my 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 honest God opinion is, the extremes of both the left and the extremes of the right are both fucked. The people in the middle, the people on the left. And the right that are not on the extremes, that don't want the extreme, that think they're only right or think they're only left or whatever the case is. The people that are on the extremes are fucked. The people in the middle, I think, could do good government. I think it should be the back and forth and all that. But I don't know about Democratic or Republican because we're liberal and conservative here in Canada with a bunch of other little parties sprinkled in there like the Green Party and QPP and all these other parties. So I know my... I know my parliament structure, my, but I don't know the states. Nor would I pick a side on the states because it wouldn't change anything anyways. But I'm for life. I'm pro-life. I'm pro whoever's going to make the united people become united again rather than divided and polarized against each other. That's who I'm for. Whatever way, shape, or form that takes, then I don't care. I'm not for a one world government and for the government system we have now with maybe just less not a reduction in for for the places of government that are seem to be maybe a little corrupt that can be proven that they are and I'm willing to say you know what take a look at every place that I think the government's corrupt in I'm willing to look at that and see if I'm right or wrong about it before I go any further on that I'm willing to do that but if there is any places in the government where it's corrupted, then the removal of that or the restructuring of that is about what I'm for. But I think there's pros and cons to everything, and this our government system is not um, is obviously subjugated to the pros and cons and all that. But anyways, I'm way off the topic. So these people that are doing these things, thinking something's being done to them, and they're reacting on, we're going to be heard because we're not being heard. You know, it's just, and I mean, watching this conspiracy junk and this truth junk and all this stuff, like, I mean, watching truth and conspiracy is the way into spirituality. I think that's like one of the opening steps. It's like, how are you going to get into any kind of spirituality if you first are pushed into a hole, into fear, into darkness, into somewhere where the things you learned as a kid through Christianity just can't help you anymore. Unless you get so scared that you run to them and you just hold the cross up and say, the power of Christ compels you or whatever and go around scared of everybody, then that's possible. I've seen that happen. Buddy Andre. But, um, oh, I fuck, I'm tired. But, um, <sighs> shit. But I think you need to go into this extreme fear to get into this extreme spirituality stuff and then you end up leveling yourself out eventually. Because I think, I think the progression somehow goes like that. It was for me anyways. And I can only speak on my, my, my journey. But it was extreme fear. Illuminati, satanic groups, eating babies, all that shit. I went through all that. Thought it was real. And then I went to extreme spirituality. All love and light, new age, law of attraction. All that ate it up like a fucking cake, man. Ate it up like it was the best thing in the world. But at the same time, I still thought the other stuff was true too. And then it wasn't until I started getting into ceremonial magic and meditating and getting intuition or 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 getting whatever you want to call it. These insights you get from the divine that would explain things to me that I now make videos and explain to you that I figured out this shit is all horse shit. It wasn't until that happened. It's because I found this path. I started the ceremonial magic and the witchcraft, which taught me how to meditate, taught me how to manifest, taught me how to do all these different fucking things. Once that happened, I was able to get out of that mindset and leave it behind. Those two extremes, the complete love and light, to the complete fear of everything, of being victim mentality, to the whole opposite. Like, no, I create everything and everybody's love. And even those evil groups are really just loving. It's like, no. That's not right either, but 
I met in the middle of that. So once again, my politics are just like when I'm talking about the spirituality. Both extremes are fucked. But when you're in the middle, when you meet closer to the middle, where the right and the left is useful, both sides are useful. Both sides are useful. And you end up in the middle, then you're more balanced. That's my opinion for every government structure. And I know it's a blanket statement. And you know, either you like Biden or you like Trump. It's like, I don't like either. I really don't. Fucking care. They don't know what their policies are and what they stand for. I think if Biden could fix the mess that fucking Trump made, that'd be great. I think if Trump could fix his own mess, that'd also be great. I don't care who's in office as long as it gets fixed. So the American people become united and there's no more deaths. That's what I care about. So, anyways, let's get back to Peterson. Well, then what the hell are you going to work for? Well, how are you going to live then? Well, Bitterly and miserably, that's for sure. Bitterly, miserably, and hopelessly, that's how you're going to live. You know, and it's so rare that I see, especially publicly, that people honestly admit with sports figures they'll do it. That's, the, that's one place where that seems to happen. But it's so uncommon for expressions of admiration and gratitude to manifest themselves in any public communication of any sort newspapers tv youtube twitter it's almost always undermining and backbiting and criticism and very often directed to people who who have often done little else but bring good things into the world for other people and that's part of why this is such a profound story He's a pretty good guy. Everyone knows it. He deserves his good fortune. All the more reason to hate him. That's for sure. Cain broods on his misfortune like a vulture on an egg. He enters the desert wilderness of his own mind. He obsesses over his ill fortune and betrayal. He nourishes his resentment. He indulges in ever more elaborate fantasies of revenge. His arrogance grows to Luciferian proportions. I'm ill-used and oppressed, he thinks. This is a stupid, bloody planet. I'm ill-used and oppressed. That's in the Bible. That's what Cain says. Well, sorry. That's like Jordan Peterson's, I guess, interpretation of it. Once again, strip away the religious fucking views and all that and just look at it as a archetypal story just a story okay that's all i want you to do we could take a movie and do this with it we could look at star wars we could look at anakin skywalker we could look at uh, skyrim we could look at uh, the avengers series we could look at anything i'm just picking peterson because he's a, he just happens to be a psychologist who has read young and freud and all these other books so his knowledge is just so much more extensive than mine that it really helps when he puts it in perspective for me and it helps me understand better and learn better but the people from the people at the capital to my ex-friend they feel betrayed misused and oppressed okay a lot of people felt oppressed when they attacked the capital you know what i mean this is cain this is the dark side of everybody we are all made up from angel and demon from bad and good, from well, devil and Jesus, from, you know, Saturn and Jupiter, whatever you want to look at it. That's within both of us. And too many people are embracing Cain right now, letting it out without having all the fucking facts and knowing what's what. I left a message to, to um, I sent, put a message on, um, Thunder Wizards, one of his videos, and I'll read it to you in a few minutes. I'll put it on here, just the audio of me reading it to you, just so you can hear it. Um, and, you know, comments are turned off. Okay, so it's not that one. Okay, so this is the comment I wrote to um, Thunder Wizard. Um, before and he made this was his second last video and then he made his newest video where he turned off the comments but I wrote if firefighters because he talks about freedom fighters in this that these people are freedom fighters the people that went into the capital so I wrote if firefighters fight fires and crime fighters fight crime then what are freedom fighters fighting 
And obviously that's they're fighting our freedoms, right? Excellent video. Don't stop trying to help us deprogram. It, even if many attack you personally, you are providing a valuable service. I'm only 34, and unless people like you from earlier years help younger generations know the way things used to be, we can't find our truth. We need wisdom from our elders, and I mean that with the most, with the utmost respect. I haven't always agreed with you or have the same beliefs, but I respect you and what you're doing. All right, so I added that in there simply just to elaborate on the point I was about to say. So when I say they didn't have all the facts, it's we are growing up in a time in, and I say we, I still mean us, like me. I'm 34, four kids, I'm still growing up, especially men. I won't get into that, but we are growing up in a time where unless my mom, my dad, people like the Thunder Wizard, my mom and dad are, uh, my dad's like a year away from 65, my, my mom two years away from 65, Thunder Wizard, I think in this video said he's pushing 60, right, so he's old enough to be my father, okay, but my parents don't tell me about this shit, they lived in Canada too, so it might be different. Um, my mom told me stories about how smoking was promoted when she was a kid. She smoked in the hospital for me, hence probably why I programmed to smoke. Um, but, and I mean, I grew up smoking or not smoking in restaurants. I grew up um, as a parent smoking at the table, you know what I mean? So, it's not, I know it's wrong now, and I should, but it's deeply embedded in me. And that could be me making an excuse for my habit. That's definitely what it sounds like. I can... See, I can kind of back away from myself and see where I'm programmed and know it's wrong. And still, yeah, I'm still doing it. So, I mean, far from perfect, but <coughs> should be what it says on my shirt, far from perfect. But the point about that is we need more people to tell us how those times were who aren't giving us propaganda, who aren't selling us things used to be like this that are inaccurate. How are we going to know what's accurate and inaccurate? Well, we need a bunch of different people like Thunder Wizard coming out and telling us the facts. What happened back then? What was going on in the 80s, in the 70s, the 60s? People from who were alive and remember what happened in the 50s, 60s are probably no longer with us. So all we have are the people that can tell us what happened in the 70s, the late 70s, 80s and 90s. Now, I was alive in the 90s. I remember some of the 90s, but I was a child in the 90s. So when I become in my 50s or 60s, I'll be able to tell people how the late 90s, early 2000s were. This is going to be 9-11 shit. This is going to be the war shit. This is going to be before cell phone and computer shit that I'm going to be able to know. But right now, I have I don't have the slightest idea of what happened. I was born in 86. So I don't know what happened. I was an 80s baby, but I don't like the late 80s, you know, so I can't know what happened. These people saying we're oppressed when there was probably laws made back in these years that we have no idea that allowed them to go on Capitol Hill or Capitol, I don't even know if it's Capitol Hill or wherever the fuck they are. I don't even know what the Capitol is. Like I know the Capitol of the United States is Washington, D.C., but Capitol building is different than the White House. And I think it's that one with the big fucking monument in front. But I don't know. I could be completely wrong as well. So, point is, we need to know why the people who went there with guns and not the people that broke into the Capitol, but the militia that's taken over right now and, and the, the free press, the media, news outlets, and social media and YouTube are saying that right now, Washington is a militia-controlled state right now. That's what it's saying. And we all know the story about Washington and the Vatican and as in England that are all their own states, like their own country within that city. So it's controlled by a militia right now. Just free protest, whatever, which is cool. They have the right to protest. The government is allowing them. They don't have to. And they are because they don't want to infringe on their rights. So it seems very hypocritical and ignorant for these people to be saying that. And I'm all for people standing up for their rights. I really, truly am. I love seeing that. But once these people are educated on how much rights they have, I hope that they do the right thing and don't just follow their programming and victim mindset and they actually decide to make a good decision. I just hope that's what happens here. And I hope no other lives are caused because I think we live in a great time where a lot of things and a lot of people fought for our rights 
And I don't want to see any of those people go down in in vain, having fought for our freedoms. It can go to hell. With that, he encounters Satan in the wilderness and falls prey to his temptations. And he does what he can in John Milton's unforgettable words to confound the race of mankind in the first root and mingle and involve earth with hell, done all to spite the great creator. He turns to evil to obtain what good forbade him, and he does it voluntarily, self-consciously, and with malice. Let him who has ears hear. So that's the first two human beings. The resentful, bitter failure taking an axe to the admirable success. My ex-friend Justin, by watching and doing drugs and watching conspiracy nonstop, decided to villainize me because I wouldn't stop doing magic even though he wanted to keep warning me that this stuff is from the devil and he wanted to keep telling me the earth was flat and he wanted to, and I just disagreed with him. We agreed to disagree, man. I don't care what you believe. I believe what I believe. We don't have to stop being friends because that was always my point of view. And he found a way to demonize me even though maybe his wife believed and did the things I promoted. Maybe he did and found that there was truth and he needed to find a way to villainize me and he did by saying, I'm sleeping with his wife, which I haven't been. And so now he's taken the symbolic axe to his own ideal. Me the success, him the bitter fucking failure. There's no going back from that, man. Like, good luck forgiving yourself for that. Especially if he was an ideal. Especially if he was your ideal. Because you haven't just killed your brother. And of course tortured your parents and the rest of your family. You've deprived the community of someone who is upstanding and you did it for the worst possible motivations. It's like there's no up from there, right? That's, that's as close to hell as you can manage on earth, I would say. And Cain said unto the Lord, my punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, thou hast driven me out this day from the face of the earth and from thy face shall I be hid that too. It's like there's also no turning back to God, let's say, after an error like that because, well, you've done everything you possibly could to spite God, assuming he exists, and the probability that you're going to be able to mend that relationship in your now broken state when you couldn't mend it to begin with before you did something so terrible starts to move towards zero. See, this is why I seriously love Peterson. Um, there's so many levels to this shit, the way he breaks down. Like, once again, strip away the religious stuff. Don't say, fuck, he's doing this Bible shit again. Like, Corey's going through the Bible. It's like, I'm going through a story to teach a lesson here. So if you listen to um, that video, either the second last or the third last one, The Thunder Wizard, where you hear the audio from the woman who's a real estate agent who wants a pardon from all her crimes... For, as she committed for following her president. What she does, she's got a fucking point. I mean, she followed her president. She was mind-fucked and misled. And now she wants her government to pardon her, even though it's the same people that she was actively on the side of threatening their lives to keep Trump into power. She wants them. So, I mean, I see this in exactly what Peterson is saying. Like now you you know you want God to forgive you you want the government to pardon you after you wanted to threaten politicians because you were somehow misled like really uh, it's that's let those who will be fooled like he who will be fooled be fooled you know you were fooled you're a fucking fool a lot of people were fucking fools and now they're butthurt about the fact that they were fooled. And I get being a militia and having a gun and going to stand there and being like, okay, this, this politician Trump mind fucked us to the point where people are being charged having to go to jail. So I want to be heard. I want to know what's true and what's not true. That I can understand. That I can get behind why they're at parliament if that's the reason. If it's not just to flaunt their power or just to get Trump back into office, fuck all that shit. If it's to say... There's too much double-sided media here meant to confuse 
us, the population, to the point where we're getting mind fucked and people are doing things that they shouldn't be doing. If that's what those people are standing for, then I'm behind it. And I will even back them up. And if I could go to the States, I'd go down there myself, but I'm not allowed in the States. Criminal record. But that I can get behind. If it's to say we need the old rules back or people need to fact check and tell us where they got their facts and, and we got to stop having maybe scientists instead of using, um, instead of just posting what they found on Facebook and people running with it as new science, it had to be peer reviewed and, you know, tested and showed the results of it so we don't just follow along with scientists that are, or maybe even fake scientists trying to say that the world is flat or, or whatever the case is, you know what I mean? So if that's what they're fighting for, then I'm all for that. Getting some new rules and structure into the mix so people aren't so easily mind-fucked and brought to conspiracy because I understand in this day and age how so many people can get stuck in the conspiracy mindset. Just in my province alone, my premier, Doug Ford of Ontario, saying the fight against COVID, all this. Yet, he just kicked a minister or somebody out of his, who was part of his party, who said the fight against coronavirus, the, um, the, the self-isolation and the mass wearing and all this stuff. This is another politician said on social media that it's doing more harm than coronaviruses, that the people dying from coronavirus is like less than a percent. Um, the rate of people beating coronavirus is even more than that. So I had the Premier of Ontario saying that this is serious. Everybody stay indoors. We're in a lockdown. And we have somebody else, part of his party, saying it's not that serious. This is bullshit. And then Doug just fired that guy or kicked him off or whatever the fuck he's from. Within my own Ontario fucking government system. And then people see this and they say, holy fuck. How can the people from the same party be on both opposite sides? Conspiracy. From there, they go check out other conspiracies. And conspiracy really does attack that orf, that endorphin part of the mind. You get a little high when you watch this shit. So it's very appealing to people. So I understand it, but it's fucking shit up. And it needs to end. So if that's what those people are fighting for, I'm all for that. But if it's for stupidity, no. No more lives need to be taken because some people are just butt hurt. None of that. That's not. All right, so I'm going to keep going. Um, I'm going to keep playing a little bit of Peterson. I'm going to switch gears. This is going to be prior to what you just saw. I'm going to watch it in reverse a little bit. Not obviously in reverse, but there's this really funny part where he talks about um, how you can run a really shitty diner. And I love it. It's, it's hilarious. I want to play that part for you. And a few little more crucial parts. And I'll interject as I think it's relevant to conspiracy, to your ideals, if you are demonizing people in society that have done well and help society, then you are going to harm yourself and not allow yourself to advance to their level of success. So anything that has to do with that, I'm going to keep chiming in on because I think that's one of the main points of the story of Cain and Abel. It's not about the first two people, being mur one being a murderer, which, you know, it's true. I mean, you can, it's a psychological story. We both have Cain and Abel in us. Some people are more Abel, some people are more Cain, but you got both within you. You know, you got Hitler and fucking whoever. You got Stalin and whoever. You got fucking, you got both polarities within you, negative and positive. We know this, especially us in romantics and in magic. We have both polarities within us. And when you embrace both sides, when you open the channels to the positive and the negative polarity they combine to make their own state which most people can't understand unless they're in that state and so they'll say stuff like we don't understand why people are just neutral and all these things and say this stuff it's like well because you don't have that polarity yet you don't have that new polarity when the positive and the negative mix together to make its own electricity its own electrical current you simply don't have that yet so how could you understand it but once you do you will so yeah, so when it comes to conspiracy, killing your own ideal, conspiracy mindset, victim mindset, and how to beat it and all that, I'll keep chiming in. If not, I'll probably just play another 10 minutes or so. Oh, God. It's like I told you that the Mesopotamians thought that mankind was made out of the blood of the worst demon that the great goddess of chaos could imagine. Well, the first human being is a murderer, and not only a murderer, a murderer of his own brother. And so, you know, Old Testament, 
that's a hell of a harsh book. And you might think, well, maybe that's a little bit too much to bear. And then you might think, yeah, and maybe it's true, too. So that's something to think about. I mean, I, human beings, you know, like, they're amazing creatures. And to think about us as a plague on the planet is its own kind of bloody catastrophe, malevolent, low, quasi-genocidal metaphor. But that doesn't mean that we're not without our problems. And the fact that this book that sets, sits at the cornerstone of our culture would present the first man as a murderer of his brother is something that should really set you back on your heels. And again, she bare his brother Abel. And Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. There you see a very old representation. There's Abel there, and he's got his sheep up on the altar, and Cain is bringing a sheaf of wheat. And I don't know exactly what's happening here with the blood, but, or it's a ray, perhaps. It's something like that. But the overall impression of the image is that something transcendent is communicating with this sacrifice. And you see, that's a, you think, oh, how primitive, you know, how primitive these people were sacrificing to their gods. <coughs> oh, shit, my bad. I sacrifice to my gods all the time. And there it is. First story in the Old Testament. Now, we know the Old Testament is most likely a Canaanite religion and Canaanite gods that were taken and turned into just one god. But the stories are most likely from Canaanite um, religion, spirituality, whatever you want to call it. Therefore, Cain and Abel, Canaanites, Cain, right, got it? Um, Cain and Abel are probably sacrificing to the Canaanite gods. So, but even before I get into anything else, okay, when people want to look at this as, oh, fucking Bible shit, I don't believe in the Bible. It's like, the Bible is polytheistic just turned monotheistic in my opinion the bible is older traditions and what they used to do changed into a newer tradition so this is why there's so much sacrifice and offerings and god you know whatever animals whatever um fucking king solomon for god's sake was a magician Three wise men came to Jesus. Like, there's so much magic in it. It's incredible. Read between the lines. It's like they don't want to come out and tell us that. But it's like, it's made for the masses, the opiate for the masses, the fucking religion for the masses. So if no one knows what to believe, well, it'd be very hard to live without a belief. So here's the book. Believe in it. If you got nothing else, but you should come up with your own shit. That's my opinion. And I think it's right, obviously, because it's my opinion. But just before anything else, sacrifice is the hypothesis as he's going to say and it's a hell of a hypothesis whether it's a sacrifice we make today for our children for a better life or it's literally my candle on my altar upstairs that i have a symbolic representation on it i offered the incense the candle and the oil and all that to the god of the week for whatever i want in return whatever it is it works it absolutely works positively and you learn it from all the traditions. And even in the Bible, they talk about sacrifice. So you can learn how to sacrifice by reading the fucking Bible. Abel is the way to do it. Cain is not the way to do it. Like, you know, those people weren't stupid. And this is not primitive. Whatever it is, it's not primitive. It's sophisticated beyond belief. Because the idea, as I already pointed out, is that you could sacrifice something of value and that that would have transcendent utility. And that is by no means an unsophisticated idea. In fact, it might be the greatest idea that human beings ever came up with. It's an answer to the problem that's put forward in the story of Adam and Eve, right? Because we became self-conscious and then we discovered the future and then we knew we were going to die and then we knew we were vulnerable and then we became ashamed and then we developed the knowledge of good and evil and then we got thrown out of paradise. It's like, that's a big problem. So what the hell are you going to do about it? Well. Sacrifice, that's the hypothesis. Well, that's a hell of a hypothesis, man. That's what we're doing. You made plenty of sacrifices, even to sit in this theater, and many people made plenty of sacrifices to 
have a theater like this exist and many people made sacrifices so that we could actually freely engage in the dialogue that we're engaging in in a theater like this. And right there, what he just said is what Thunder Wizard also said. So somebody who believes in the Bible versus a shaman who doesn't believe in the Bible, both roughly around the same age, both have the same opinion about the youth and today and people not being grateful and always, you know, shitting on people who are elites and all this. You know, Thunder Wizard says it in a different way, but it's like there's no elites out there doing this to you. This was put in your head by whoever. Now, Thunder Wizard offers a new conspiracy for people, which is not a new conspiracy. It's an old conspiracy. And as far as I can tell, there's fucking something to it. But in the same sense, he's talking about how the people went to Capitol Hill and got a permit by their government to walk around with fucking, I don't know if they're automatic rifles or just rifles and sidearms, but with fucking guns, walk around and protest freely and stand in front of a bunch of fucking cameras being heard saying, I feel like I'm not hurt. And what did Peterson just fucking say in this fucking clip? Like, like, holy fuck, a lot of people sacrificed just for you to be able to sit in here and just have this debate. They sacrificed to make this. They sacrificed for you to be alive today. We, she, we need to be goddamn more fucking grateful for what we have instead of being little fucking victim bitches always bitching about what's wrong with our life. Like, let's grow the fuck up, all of us. 20-year-olds, the 30-year-olds, the 40-year-olds, whoever thinks that it's being done to us. Let's grow the fuck up. It's time. It's time to realize how fucking lucky we are and that we're not fucking in trouble and we're not fucking cursed and there's no fucking devil and all this demon bullshit. Time to give all that fucking shit up. And let's make this world a better fucking place. Finally. Because people have been trying for so long. And we've lost people along the way who've tried and died for fucking what they believe in. And I'm not saying the people at Capitol don't believe in what they're fucking doing. But they're confused. And maybe it's not their fault entirely. But if I was able to come into this knowledge being 34. And know that I don't know everything. But I'm trying to actively learn. Then what the hell is wrong with the other people? How come they can't do it? Right? There's got to be a way they can. If I can do it, they can fucking do it. And so it's like all of this is built on sacrifice and sacrifice bloody well better work because we do not have a better idea. Sacrifice, what's the counter position? Murder and theft. So let's go with sacrifice, shall we? And perhaps we won't consider it so damn primitive, you know, because it's not so primitive. And again, she bare his brother Abel. And Abel was a keeper of sheep, and Cain was a tiller of the ground. Now some people have read into this the eternal battle between herdsmen and agriculturalists, which raged in the American West, for example, because the herdsmen liked to have their herds, sheep, cattle, go wherever they were going to go. And of course the agriculturalists, the farmers, liked to have things fenced off. And so, and the agriculturalists actually won in the final analysis but anyways, Abel is a keeper of sheep. And that's interesting because that makes him a shepherd. And I think that's part of the critical issue here because a shepherd, I talked a little bit about shepherds before. You know, if you look at Michelangelo's statue of, da of David, which is another staggering work. I mean, that David, he's no trivial figure. And of course, it's David who sli slays Goliath, right? And Goliath is like the giant of the patriarchal enemy. It's something like that. And, you know, Middle Eastern shepherds, they had to take, take care of sheep and they're edible and the lambs are very vulnerable. And there were lots of wild animals around. It wasn't like England in the 16th century. It was like there were lions, you know? And you had a slingshot or a stick or some damn thing. And so your job was to keep the sheep organized and not let them be eaten by the lions alone and so you had to have a clue and be tough and self-reliant and all of those things you had to be tough and self-reliant you had to be, be able to take care of a lot of vulnerable things you had to be able to do it on your own and so that's all built into the shepherd metaphor and it's you know it's a tough thing for it's not a great metaphor for modern people because we tend to think of the shepherd as someone like little lord Fauntleroy, you know, like some little, certainly not a lion-killing 
hyper-masculine, lion-killing, you know, monster. That's not a shepherd. A shepherd sort of dances around and, you know, it's not, that's not the metaphor here. That's, that's, that's not the metaphor here. So Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. Okay, so he's participating in this sacrificial ritual. And Abel, he brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. Maybe God is just like liking you a little better than he's liking him. And that's, I think, useful from a literary perspective because there is that arbitrariness about life. You know, with my own children, for example, one of them has had, I would say, he, things come easy to him. He's lucky, fortunate, however you want to put it. He, he seems to be that sort of person. Whereas my other child is like, it's just like one horrible Job-like catastrophe after another. And it's so strange to see that because as far as I can tell, there's the character logical differences are certainly not accounting for the, for the, for the difference in destiny. You know, my one, the one child who's had so much trouble, I mean, as a child, was just a wonderful child. So... Amazingly happy and easy to get along with and fun. And had a terrible time of it. So, who knows what God's up to. But distributing fate equally certainly isn't one of them. And the Lord, Lord, because you think about how human that story is, you know. You're out there... Well, we could say, you might be a useless character and, you know, you're whining about how catastrophic your life is and it's pretty much obvious to everyone around you and you that it's your fault. You just don't try. You don't wake up in the morning. You don't get a job. You don't... I went quite a while there without fucking chiming in, so that's pretty good. Anyways, now he's getting into useless people. And I was one of those. I was one who was whining when I was at Matrix and thus after when I was into fear-based media. And then even when I got into the opposite extreme, I went to fear-based media and believed in satanic elite Illuminati groups. And then I went all the way to the other polarity. Once again, like I already stated, the extremes of both political parties are the problem. But the, the ones that are in the middle, cause it's, it's like this big fucking thermometer. You're minus, you know. Your minus two isn't bad. It's like your plus two isn't bad. But when it's fucking plus fucking 30 something with a humidity that's crazy, or it's minus 30 something and the windshield is crazy, well, that's extreme. Well, that's kind of how political is and spirituality can be. The people in the extremes are fucked. People in the middle that can kind of, you know, meet other people halfway because they're not so fucking polarized. Well, that's okay. Anyways, I went from one extreme to the next. And that was useful, and I needed to. But at those times, I was that useless character he's fucking talking about that I'm going to refer to as my ex-friend Justin is now. Not waking up on time, pissing his life away, not raising his daughter how he should, not being nice to his probably his girlfriend or wife, and she probably has not been nice to him. I mean, I've heard some stories both ways, though. Um, but, you know, nonetheless, like, they're not doing so well. Especially Justin, he's not doing anything but drugs and conspiracy and wants more curb money and living off the system when he's willing and able to work so you know and he's gonna sit there complaining about the elite groups that are fucking him up this way he's got an excuse to sit there on welfare not get a job and not try to better his life it's just easier just to blame people for what they're doing to him it's not his fault he's just another victim it's like no grow up You've been into the fucking fear-based shit for a while now. Like, time to move to the other side. And you don't have to come the same route as me. Find your own path. I don't care. But get out of that crap, man. It's about time. But that's what he's talking about here. It's people like that. And on some level, they damn well know that they're part of the fucking problem. Most people know that they're part of that problem when they're in that situation. Engage in things, you're cynical and you're bitter and you're angry and you don't try to help the people near you and you, you don't try to fix up your own life and you don't take care of yourself and, you know, 
and then things go wrong, and it's like, well, really, what do you expect? But then, but that's, that, I mean, that doesn't mean someone in that situation will just say, well, that's okay, I deserve it, and they'll be happy about it. They won't. They'll be absolutely bitter about it and angry. But, you know, put that aside for a moment, there are people who seem to struggle very forthrightly, let's say, and still have one catastrophe after another happen to them. And so, it's, it, there's no easy answer in this, in this story. It's like, you can fall, fall afoul of God because your sacrifices are second rate, or you can just fall afoul of God and you don't know why. Well, tough luck for you. And then, what happens in either case is exactly this, almost inevitably, Cain was wroth and his countenance fell. You have to admire Hitler, that's the thing. Because he was an organizational genius. You know, the thing that doesn't stop people from being Hitler, the thing, people don't, people don't refuse the ambition to become Hitler because they don't have the genocidal motivation. They don't follow that pathway because they don't have the organizational genius. They've got the damn motivation. And you know, if you take a hundred people randomly and you talk to them, and you really talk to them, you'll find that five percent of them would take their vengeful thoughts pretty damn far if they were just given the opportunity. And in fact, they do because they make life miserable for themselves and often for their family and sometimes for anybody they can come near. Like, it's beautiful. It's absolutely poetic. And this video completely explains, like, everything that I'm talking about. He just said it. My friend Justin lacks the organizational genius, but he's taking his Hitler-like fantasies, his dark shit, and fucking up his own life. And when that's not enough, He's trying to infect my life with his own fantasies of fucking whatever and trying to fuck myself up, you know? Even Josie, the first uh, message she sent me was, I'm coming to straighten this out with your wife. It's like, get the fuck out of my life. Talk to your husband. He's the fucking problem. Now, she didn't know that, so I get that, but still. It's like, where's the proof? Did he show you any proof? Like, why are you going to come to my house whenever you just got his word? If I would have admitted to something, do you not think he would have at least recorded it? Or if it was a text message and I have you the proof, I deleted it by accident. Like, come on. But anyways, point is, he's saying it. He's trying to affect other people's lives. When people are miserable, they want everybody else to be miserable. And when someone, especially someone similar, especially someone who is an ideal, especially someone who is, who might have been in their place before when they start doing better they fucking hate it because it's proof to them that they could be better and they don't want that they want to sit in their ignorance and their vile fucking way of mistreating people and blaming and victim and scarcity mindsets and they just want to infect everybody with that around them and they fucking hate when anybody does anything fucking good because then they can't fucking blame God and fucking blame society and fucking blame the government and fucking blame reptilians and fucking aliens and all that shit when really all they're doing is just trying to pass the blame on everything else but themselves. It's fucking pathetic. And then maybe another 20% of people have that bubble up in them on a pretty damn regular basis. So... You know, you can have some sympathy for Cain. If you don't have any sympathy for Cain, then you're not. See, Cain and Abel also, they don't just represent two archetypal types of being. They represent, so it's not like you're Cain and you're Abel and you're Cain and you're Abel. It's like you're half and half and you're half and half and you're half and half. It's something like this. This is two different potential patterns of destiny. And you, you don't manifest one purely and the other zero. It's like, you're, it's, it's like the line between good and evil that runs down the human heart. It's exactly the same idea. And maybe you're more like Cain or maybe you're more like Abel, but there's still a little Cain in you no matter how Abel you are. And maybe more than a little and probably more than a litter, little. And if you watch your fantasies, which I would very much recommend, you'll find that they show you dark things about you that will shock you if you allow yourself to be conscious of what you're thinking. So, it's a good time when you're having an argument with someone, especially someone that you love, 
to just watch the pictures that flash in the back of your mind. That's part of, let's say, coming into contact with what Carl Jung called the shadow. And the shadow is the manifestation of Cain. This is, this is great information here, by the way. So people want to know about the shadow side and all fucking YouTube shadow work and all this and get a bunch of spiritual people regurgitating the same information. Yet, he put on some motherfucker talking about the Bible. Some Harvard preset professor from fucking uh, from Canada. And he'll tell you. You want to come in contact with your shadow. You want to know what your shadow's trying to relate to you. When you're having an argument with somebody. Try to be conscious of the thoughts coming to your head. The pictures coming to your mind. So when I was having that argument with Josie on the phone. And I was texting Justin. And I could literally see my axe going through his face. As bad as that sounds. I was conscious of that. Even more than that. I threatened him with it. Now. Was it because I was actually going to do it? Who knows? Maybe when he got here, I'd totally bitch out. Maybe I can't. Maybe taking in my dog's life because she was my responsibility was easier than taking a human life. Maybe. Who knows? I was pretty angry. I was pretty cane like in that moment. But I was more like Abel, pissed off at Cain, getting revenge in reverse. Like, you're not killing me this time, Cain. I'm fucking killing you, bud. I'm never going down your path again, even though two wrongs don't necessarily make it right either. But this is a great exercise that to do and then he goes into thinking that why would you think your thoughts are your own you don't pick your damn dreams yet they're coming from your own mind so why would you think your thoughts you get to pick or you have any choice in them and that is such good advice or such good knowledge to fucking know and this is the whole basis of reject banish deny because if you can't pick your dreams, and you can't deny your dreams, you, we can wake up maybe if you become conscious in your dream somehow, and it's like, holy fuck, it's a dream, and then boom, you wake up, which happens to me very, um, very often. I can take control of my dream for a bit, but anytime I try to do anything radical, try to get something to manifest by doing dream magic or whatever the case is, I tend to wake up. So, you know, but nonetheless, it's practicing. It's practicing a unconscious state of being conscious within it. You know, so I'm trying, but if you can't pick your dreams and you can't banish or reject your dreams, well, your thoughts, you can. And if these thoughts aren't necessarily coming from you, yet they're coming from you, but they're coming from the part of you, that reality maker. So every thought you get of you being poor, if you reject it, then there's a good chance you won't be poor because it's coming from that reality maker within you. I like using that word for some reason, the subconscious mind, the unconscious, whatever you want to call it. The thing that's giving you all these ideas like, hey, you're going to be rich one day. Yeah, accept that. No, you're going to be poor one day. You know, it's like Cain and Abel fighting in you. It's like, no, you're never going to be rich. And people let that Cain take over within them. Like my buddy, he's letting that Cain take over. And he wants to kill me because I'm fucking his wife and I'm successful and I'm everything he's not. And he's going to find a fucking reason to destroy me. And I'm going to stand up for myself and say, fuck you, buddy. You ain't winning this Cain and Abel fight against me, asshole, buddy. But nonetheless... The Cain and Abel battle within you, or the demon and angel battle within you, the demon, if you want to, so if you will, let's say the demon's the bad guy, or the, for you, it might be the good guy, the angel might be the bad guy, I don't know, and I'm okay with whatever you pick, but one of those is bad, one of those is good, and the one inside of you is saying, you're always going to be poor, you banish that, the one that says you're always going to be rich, you accept that, and maybe that creates your reality for you. And at the very least, at least you're going to have healthy self-talk and have a positive self-image. And at the very least, to start up spiraling and having positive thoughts more often. At the very least, at the very most, like I said, I was able to use that technique to stop the rain that was supposed to happen all day. In fact, the weather that day said rain all fucking day, yet the sun came out. But I was able to finish my, my chainsawing on my tree. So, be make that as you will. Yeah, this part's pretty important. And I'm not too much more after this. I think I'm going to play the one part with the diner. And then I'm going to play the beginning where someone wrote him a note saying something pretty cool. But I won't even comment on that. I'll just let it play out. So, yeah. This will probably be the last time I chime in on this unless there's something really, really dire. So, yeah, anyways, if I don't come back on, I appreciate everybody who watched. And hopefully you got the message. And yeah, have yourself a great fucking day. It's a perfect way of thinking about it. And one of the things that Jung said about the shadow, because Jung was not someone you mess around with lightly. He said the human shadow has roots that reach all the way to hell. And Jung meant that. That's no metaphor for him. Now, he might not have meant it in the same way that a fundamentalist Christian from, from the southern U.S. might mean it. 
But I would say that Jung meant it in a way that's far more terrifying and also far more true. So, you know, let's say that you have an impulse to make a sacrifice. You think, well, I should change this about my life. Well, it's like, where does that come from, that impulse? It's just, well, it just it manifests itself out of nothing. So, well, or you came up with it. Well, you might want to stop thinking about that, thinking so surely that you come up with your own thoughts. You don't come up with your damn dreams, do you? They just happen. And God only knows where they come from. They come from your brain. Oh boy, that's a sophisticated answer. They come from your unconscious. Well, that's not much better. At least it's somewhat better. But there are those ma amazing dramas take place in the theater of your imagination at night. You don't even understand what they are, and yet they occur night after night. And those things, dreams, they can contain wisdom. That It just, well, it just staggers the person who has the dream once they get the key to the dream, once they remember it. It's like, oh, look, you just revealed a bunch of wisdom to yourself that you didn't know. Well, where'd that come from? Well, you don't know. How in the world can you dream up things that you don't know? That's a tough one. Maybe we'll talk about that at some point in this lecture series because there are some reasonable things that can be said about that. But, you know, the idea that there's something that's not you. Jung would call it the self. Carl Jung would call it the self, which he thought of the, as the totality of your being across time and space. It's something like that. And that, you know, each second that you exist is a slice of the self manifesting itself across time and space and he thought of the the self as partly the voice of conscience whatever that is that helps guide you when you have to make a difficult decision and, and a difficult decision might be well what do i need to sacrifice what is how do i need to discipline myself right what do i need to forego well how do you figure those things out well, you know, this picture is trying to put forth the idea that perhaps if you had established the proper relationship with God the Father, and we've talked about what that might mean, then he would help figure out how to get the sacrificial fires burning so that you could stay in a proper relationship with him across time. Well, is that such an unreasonable proposition? It, what's the alternative proposition? Well, this isn't working out very well, that's for sure. Good diner that, that he happened to visit, Bukowski happened to visit when he was on a bus when he was a, when he was a kid. A diner where everything was going well. And you could listen to that, it's great, I think it's great. But this is the opposite diner I'm thinking about. So you go into a diner, right? It's seven o'clock in the morning and you order some bacon and eggs and some toast. And, and then you look around in the diner and you think, it was like 1975 when the windows were last washed and there's this kind of thick coating of who gives a damn grease on the, on the walls, you know, and, and the floor too has got that sort of stickiness that you really have to work at to develop over years. You know, and the waitress is, she's not happy to be there and the guy behind the counter isn't happy that that happens to be the waitress that he's working with. And then, you know, you walk down the stairs maybe to the washroom and that's its own little trip. And so <laughs> you come back and you order your damn eggs and you order your toast and you order your bacon and then it comes and <laughs> like the eggs are too cooked on the bottom so they're kind of brown and then they're kind of raw on top and, and they're cold in the middle, which is, <laughs> you really have to work to cook an egg like that, man, but you can master that with like 10 years of bitterness, you <laughs> teach you how to cook an egg like that. And then the toast, here's what you do with the toast, right? You put, <laughs> you take, you, you take the white bread, you know, the pre-sliced stuff that no one should ever eat. And then you put that in the toaster and you overcook it. And then you wait and then you pop it out of the toaster. And then because it's overcooked, you scrape it off. <laughs> and you knock off the crumbs so it doesn't look too burnt. And then you wait till it's cold. And then you put cold margarine on it because if you put cold margarine, first of all, not butter. But if you put cold margarine on, you can also kind of tear holes in it so that then it has lumps of margarine in it and it's really dry except where it's too greasy. So that's like its own little work of art, man. And then you put that on the side with the, with the, with the eggs and then you have the potatoes and this is how you cook the potatoes properly. <laughs> yeah. You know, so they're leftover potatoes. And you keep dumping new leftover potatoes into the old leftover potatoes over weeks. And so some of the potatoes have, they're no longer potatoes, right? <laughs> They've half returned to Mother Earth. <laughs> then you flap them on the grill and you sort of, 
I don't know, you burn them a bit, I guess, and then you slap them on the plate, and Jesus, you don't want to eat those, man. (laughs) That's for sure, and that's the point. And then you have the bacon, and you want to make sure you buy the lowest possible quality bacon. that's, That's how you start. And then you throw it on the grill, and you don't, your grill has to be overheated to do this. You have to cook the bacon so that it's raw in places and burnt in other places. And it has that delightful pig-like odor that only really cheap, badly cooked bacon can provide. Or maybe you use those little breakfast sausages that no one in their bloody right mind would let within 15 feet of anything living, you know. And then you serve that, right? And you serve it with the kind of orange juice that is only orange in color. <laughs> and, and with coffee that's... Oh, what would you say? It was started too early in the morning. That's the first thing. P- bad quality coffee started too early in the morning, r- got cold once or twice and has been reheated. And then you serve that with whitener. <laughs> it's like... Here's your breakfast. It's like, no, man, that's not breakfast. That's hell. <laughs> you know? And, and you created it. And then what you do, if you have a diner like that, is because you have a miserable life if you have a diner like that, and you've really worked on achieving that, is every night you go home and you curse your wife and you curse your kids and you fucking well curse God too for producing a universe where a diner like yours is allowed to exist and that's your bloody life so also that's what God's trying to point out here is So I'm going to read you something. I get some, I get a lot of mail. And I don't know where I got this. I've, I've been a lot of different places in the last week. And this showed up at one of them. And I'm going to read it to you. I have no idea what to make of it. <laughs> it's written in a female hand. So that's about all I can tell. But there's no address or name on it. This isn't a question, but a comment. Or more accurately, perhaps, a message. I spent this past weekend in an ayahuasca ceremony, which for those of you who don't know, is a South American visionary plant medicine. Some of you may roll your eyes at this, but ayahuasca brings you into direct contact with the archetypal realm of being. Users of this medicine, initiates I should say, refer to ayahuasca as she, because the spirit of the plant is decidedly feminine, an encounter with ayahuasca is an encounter with the great mother of creation, the goddess, the void from which all things come, the feminine counterpart of Logos. Dr. Peterson, you appeared in one of my ayahuasca visions. might account for why I've been rather fatigued lately. (laughs) Dr. Peterson, you appeared in one of my ayahuasca visions, and I asked, asked her, who is Jordan Peterson? What is he doing? Which is something I'd really like to know as well. (laughs) (laughs) And she responded with crystalline clarity. Quote, here, he is here to invoke and initiate the divine masculine principle on earth at this time. (laughs) So I'm up here to thank you deeply and profoundly on behalf of the Great Mother herself, the Goddess, the Divine Feminine Principle, who has been eagerly awaiting the awakening of the Masculine Principle into divinity and service. So, you know, get a letter like that every day. (laughs) Actually, I get a letter or two like that every day. (laughs) So, you know, what went through my head